Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Albert Park. I'm the director of the Institute for Emerging Market Studies at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So I'm very happy to welcome everyone to today's event. Uh, a special welcome to alumni and friends of HKUST, and also to uh, some of our senior managers from uh, EY, uh, who have been very supportive for our institute's activities, uh, Henry Chan and uh, Lucy Wong. Um, I think you all agree that this is a great opportunity to hear leading experts discuss global perspectives on the One Belt, One Road initiative since we're right here during the One Belt, One Road Summit being hosted by the Chinese government with 29 heads of states in town, some I believe staying at this hotel. Uh, I'm sure if you, even if you didn't realize it before, now we all appreciate how uh, great the potential is for this initiative to shape the future development trajectories of countries around the globe. In President Xi's uh, speech yesterday morning, and also in the speech of President Putin from Russia, both really emphasize the impo important role that research think tanks can play in the success of the One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, this event is sponsored by three institutions, research institutes, uh, the HKUSD Institute for Emerging Market Studies, which I direct, also, the Center for New Structural Economics at Peking University, directed by Justin Lin, and the Institute for Emerging Market Studies at the Moscow School of Management, Skolkovo, directed by Alexei Kalinin. And this collaboration uh, between my institute and Alexei's institute is part of a new uh, institution-level collaboration between the business school at HKUST and the Moscow School of Management at Skolkovo. Uh, which uh, is directed by Steve DeCray, who's also here sitting at the head table. So I want to thank Steve for his service. Um, we also have a very close uh, connection with Justin's Institute. Uh, Justin is a former distinguished faculty and honorary doctorate holder of HKUST. And his associate director, Wang Yong, uh, Yong Wang, is, uh, also holds a faculty position at HKUST and is an associate of our institute. Uh, in the future, uh, IEMS, Institute for Emerging Market Studies at HKUSD, will be engaged in an ongoing multi-year research project on the One Belt, One Road initiative on trade and investment issues supported by the Hong Kong government. And we are planning to work closely with colleagues at uh, Skolkovo and hopefully also at Justin's Institute on uh, learning new insights into the issues that confront the implementation of this initiative and the implications for various types of economic actors and uh, businesses. Uh, so in, at our institute, we've also recently announced a China initiative. There are some flyers, I think, in your materials, uh, jointly with our university's Institute for Public Policy, to really engage a range of issues affecting the economic future of China, not just One Belt, One Road, but technology, um, employment issues, a host of, uh, a host of, a host of issues. Uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce very briefly the three speakers before they talk, and then they'll come up sequentially. We've asked each of the panelists to speak for about 15 minutes, and after that is done, We'll take a very, like a one minute break to set up some chairs and invite all of the speakers uh, to the stage uh, to answer questions posed by myself and members of the audience. So you can think of questions that you may have uh, as you listen to the presentations. So Justin Evil then uh, is, as I said, the director of the Center for New Structural Economics. He's also, has many titles, the dean of the Institute of South-South Cooperation, uh, which is an important institution also for One Belt, One Road. Um, he's Honorary Dean, National School of Development at Peking University. He's also the Council, uh, the Vice Chairman of the All China Federation of Industry and Commerce. He, of course, was the Senior Vice President and Chief Economist of the World Bank through 2012 and served earlier for 15 years as the Founding Director and Professor of the China Center for Economic Research uh, at Peking University. Mr. Alexei Klinin uh, is the Director of the Skolkovo Institute for Emerging Market Studies. Uh, 
Um, he is an experienced strategist, change leader, and international business developer, develop, business developer with a significant track record on energy and business education, so has a range of experience in the energy industry. He holds a diploma in global business from the University of Oxford and an MBA from Moscow State University. And finally, Professor Alicia Garcia Herrero, who just joined us and is sitting now at the head table, is Chief Economist for Asia Pacific at Nexus an investment bank based in Hong Kong, and uh, she has held a host of positions at various uh, international financial institutions like the IMF, the Bank of International Sett Settlements, um, various commercial banks, uh, and she is also now teaching at HKUSD, so is an adjunct faculty in the economics department and an associate of our institute. So without any further ado, let me uh, invite Justin to the stage. Albert, thank you for the introduction, and it's a great pleasure for the Center for Infrastructure Economics to co-host this meeting together with HKUSD, IEMS, as well as SCOCOF. And uh, and uh, I'd like to share with you some of my ideas about the impact for the, you know, what kind of things that the their role initiative can bring to the developing country. As you know, the Bear and Road Initiative emphasizes the infrastructural connectivities and uh, use that <coughs> and China sets up Chevrolet Fund and AIIB to support this initiative. Infrastructure bottlenecks certainly is one of the major barriers for developing country to have inclusive and sustainable growth. And uh, you know, to have this fair and role initiative is a win-win for China, for other developing world. But the importance of infrastructure is not only recognized by China. The US also understands the importance of that. So under the Obama administration, the U.S. launched the India-Pacific Economic Corridor as well as New Sugar Road Initiative in 2011 to connect India Ocean and Pacific Ocean by infrastructure as well as to connect, to connect Afghanistan and Central Asian countries with the Pacific Ocean. But so far, the US initiatives have not get much attention in the world anymore. And in China, this AIIB currently has 57 funding members, in spite of the US put a lot of pressures on some country to join AIIB. And uh, like it is, Bear and Road Forums, there are 29 heads of state came to this forum and more than 100 delegations from developing country as well as developed country to attend this forum. And what's the reason why an initiative by China gets so much support in the world? And a US initiative did not get much attention. I think there are several reasons. One is that China currently produces more than half of the construction material in the world, like steel, cement, aluminum, and so on. And uh, to have this infrastructure project, we need to have this kind of construction materials. China also had the strength in the implementation, because in the, in the period of China's transition, from planning economy to market economy, China has huge, massive infrastructure project. And as you can observe, China currently is proud to have one of the most advanced infrastructure in the world. And those would be desirable. That means China can provide those kind of infrastructure project at a much lower prices than any other country. China also has three trillion US dollars of return. And China's each year also have some, you know, trade surplus. 
and the domestic saving is more than 50% of GDP. And with those kind of financial resources, China can fund the infrastructure projects. But equally important is that to make the infrastructure project generate sufficient economic returns, we need to have economic activities to use those kind of infrastructure projects. And one way to use those kind of infrastructure projects is to have industrialization. And we know that China is about to relocate its light manufacturing to other low income countries like Japan in the 1960s, the East Asian high goods in the 1980s. And if the developing country can capture this opportunity of China to relocation of land manufacturing to their countries, they may be able to enjoy dynamic economic growth as China and other East Asian economies in the post-World War II periods. And with this kind of dynamic you know, economic uh, growth generated by the industrialization, certainly they will make the return to the infrastructure project high enough to repay the infrastructure project. But in addition to that, one very important thing is development ideas. After the Second World War, we have about 200 developing economies in the world. So far, only two to move from low income to high income. One is Korea, the other one is Taiwan, China. And the mainland China is likely to be the third one to move from low income country to high income country by the time of 2025. So that means that after the Second World War, most developing countries have not been able to you know, succeed in the economic development. And it was not because they did not try. I think it was because they are guided by the ideas from the people country. And we know that the ideas for economic theory, its applicability very much depends on the preconditions. And the developing country precondition is quite different from the preconditions in high income country. And that's the reason why the development effort guided by the theory, the ideas from the developing country, from the developed country cannot succeed, you know, in spite of all the effort has been put into that. And China, in the past, you know, three, three decades and more, uh, that kind of experiences can generate many ideas and uh, lessons and uh, theories which will be more applicable to other developing countries because precondition in China will be, you know, are likely to be more similar to the preconditions in other developing countries. So that means that with its infrastructure development and also the pending relocation of land manufacturing from China, plus the ideas of development that generate from China's experiences, the developing country will have the opportunity to transform themselves successfully, to move from low income to middle income, even to high income country within one or two generations. And with this kind of development, certainly will also be good for other developed countries. Because we know the developed country in the US, in Eurozone, and Japan have not fully recovered from the 2008 global financial crisis. So they are experiencing so-called the new norm. That means the economic growth rate is low, the risk in their economy is high. And if other parts of the developing world can grow dynamically, it will create opportunity market for them and will support them to get out of the 2008 global financial crisis. So I think that this initiative is good for China and it's also good for the rest of the world, including developing country and developed country. And maybe we have an opportunity to be a, reach a stage that a world free of poverty will be a dream realized. Thank you very much. Very special that I'm here today because it actually it's the first time 
to do uh, something together with uh, HKUST after we have signed a uh, memorandum of understanding working together. So it's the first event in this uh, partnership and then we are very much looking forward to fruitful cooperation with uh, this institution. And um, also it's a great honor for me personally to be here and uh, among such uh, respected uh, scholars uh, in the panel and as well as to speak to such a great audience. Uh, my perspective here would be uh, on Central Asia as a uh, Russian business school or Russia-based business school, you can imagine that we uh, attach huge attention to this region because it's strategically important for Russia and Russian business and that's why our clients they expect us to have an insight on that so we would be very much happy to share some ideas on that region with you today as well as further on. Uh, but um, we also believe that what we think about this region in uh, connection with One Belt, One World Initiative has applicability far beyond this region per se, because some issues we are uh, addressing are probably relevant to the other parts of uh, the world as well, where uh, One Belt, One World initiative is supposed to be implemented. Um, so, uh, to start with, uh, uh, our uh, thinking starts with a very simple observation that uh, One Belt, One Road, which is definitely and obviously the largest ever uh, complex development initiative that has ever been undertaken by the Green Pact. Numbers are terrific. But at the same time, it's supposed to be uh, implemented in the one of the most unknown, diverse, and volatile regions such as Central Asia. This sounds really like a music for a business school here because you can imagine how much studies we can make about all those risks and uncertainties. But probably it's not, it doesn't sound that great to the business, the implementing agents because they are somewhere in uh, this unknown land. And uh, uh, I will go into more details on this region right now, touching upon some such perspectives as diversity and dynamics, which is in there. But before going there, I should mention that the region itself, it has always been in the center of uh, civilizations, in between of different civilizations, Islamic world, China, um, Persian Empire, Russian Empire, whatever. Uh, but at the same time, this, uh, countries that we are talking about today, they have never existed before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's uh, the Soviet legacy, the, the, the current borders of these countries. And we know how many uncertainties uh, can come from the artificial borders set up by somebody else. We observe this in other parts of the world as well. And it's natural that those countries in Central Asia and Caucasus in the last 25 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union has not often been in the, uh, probably in the news, and mainly because they were, they've been yeah, inward looking, addressing mainly their internal issues. But at the same time, what we believe now, there is no such thing as an internal issue for any country which lies on the Belt Road, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Because interconnectedness means interdependence as well. And as they say, the caravan is on the as fast as its slowest can. So uh, that's why we believe that we have to learn more and as much as the more we learn about the uh, regions, the, the more we understand them, uh, the more we can convert our risks in our promises and our chances. So, um, yeah, what we are talking about now is this region. If this uh, Central Asia and Caucasus was a single country, 
it would be, just to put it on some scale for you, it would be smaller than Brazil, but bigger than South Africa. It, more or less, it, 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 you know the indicators, like population, economy, size of economy, the economic growth, and the diversity, and things like that. But you can, you can imagine, over 100 uh, peoples live there, different ethnicities. Uh, they practice all possible religions, speak tens of uh, languages, and they are young and vibrant. Every, uh, average age is like 27 years old. And they are very educated, 100%, almost close to 100% literacy rate and lots, and up to 50% of uh, higher education applications. So it's a very important, very potential uh, region, but at the same time, it's a uh, very complicated one. So, uh, touching upon diversity, I will move quickly here, but uh, you see the numbers, you see the, the facts, that what we have there is the whole spectrum of political models, from very young democracies like uh, Kyrgyzstan, for example, um, uh, or to very authoritarian and authoritarian countries like Turkmenistan. All these national, uh, all these democracy with national specifics in, in, in Kazakhstan as well. So uh, we've got that. And what we also got is the transition. Because most of the countries, they've been concurrently led by either the same leaders uh, who uh, ran them during the Soviet period of time or uh, their uh, uh, sons, in two countries they are the sons of uh, those leaders. So we see, but at the same time we see, we observe the transition of power to more uh, liberal and younger generation, which also creates some uncertainty, but there's at the same time uh, lots of hopes. Economic systems, uh, some countries are resource uh, rich, some are not, and those who are researched, that are research rich, they benefited from them, and, and obviously their economies, they are kind of uh, shifted and uh, a little um, de deformated in, in terms of the structures in favor, for the favor of the natural uh, resources. But other countries uh, that have no natural resources, they probably rely more on uh, like Soviet legacy and their connection with Russia. In some countries, remittances that migrant workers uh, sent home from Russia, they uh, equal uh, like 40% of their GDPs. So it's a, it, these are huge numbers, and these countries are hugely dependent on this very elementary, very basic sort of income. Also, again, uh, touching upon this uh, social and cultural uh, perspective, Again, we observe lots of uh, different uh, peoples, even within the cities. Uh, they are not purely national republics, although uh, uh, they call like Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan, which is supposed to mean certain ethnicity, but not uh, exactly. So lots of uh, ethnical uh, diversity is it, 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 there's lots of ethnical diversity within the same single country, but also in the region, which makes uh, the social and cultural uh, uh, perspective quite worse. Uh, I won't go uh, too far in, in uh, um, indicators, but as you can see on the slide from all those numbers that you've got, it quite uneven. So uh, all, all the possible uh, the whole spectrum, actually, of the countries. So, and uh, but still, this uh, is the same region as we believe. And uh, uh, the challenge here is how to implement projects, how to implement policies in uh, the region that is that diverse. Um, and what is important as well is that this region is not isolated. It's been uh, influenced by lots of uh, external or contextual powers. And I would just touch upon this structure mainly rather than go into detail uh, on the, each of them. So universal partners that we call them, uh, Russia and China, uh, 
call them universal because they work in, 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 in all possible directions and dimensions, tra trade, investment, uh, humanitarian exchange, uh, lots of things, security as well, and uh, lots of perspectives. And these are the strategic uh, relationship. We also have Islamic powers like Turkey and opening Iran um, and Saudi Arabia, which make a very uh, considerable impact on uh, this region from uh, economic perspective, but as also from the uh, Islamization perspective as well. And uh, obviously uh, the social dynamics is quite uh, say, uh, uh, affected by the dynamics in this uh, region. You've heard about well, uh, 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 instability in Turkey and uh, in, uh, the opening around uh, ISIS and this sort of thing. So the, the region is very um, connected to those uh, uh, countries and the processes in there. Uh, sexual development partners, uh, Japan and, and South Korea um, interact very intensively with these countries and pay a lot of attention to uh, national resources, but also invest in infrastructures and uh, uh, support innovation and uh, education uh, perspective as well. And now people have, uh, from those regions, uh, have uh, started to move to South Korea for work, for example, not Russia anymore, but not only Russia. Uh, and uh, security and institution partners like the United States and Europe, but they uh, they were much more active uh, like five, seven, ten years ago. But now their uh, role in the region uh, has been you know, constantly declining, and uh, we don't see much of their uh, uh, influence in the future. Uh, dynamics. Uh, Partially going from uh, the regional processes. Again, I should mention the integrational integration platforms like Eurasian Economic Union, which is uh, the which is uh, the initiative that Russia supports a lot, and this is supposed to be an economic union of all the Eurasian uh, countries, and it now it unites Armenia, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan from the region, but. Uh, Obviously, we expect that more and more countries will uh, be joining the Union. And at the moment, this is the only economic uh, uh, institutional kind of framework that exists in the region. And we expect it to play more and more importance throughout the implementation of One Belt, One Road initiative because you need institutions. And this is probably one of the very few institutional frameworks that uh, has already been uh, implemented in the region. We've got two more organizations, mainly with the security um, uh, and role, but uh, again, since the region is very vulnerable to the security threats and terrorism, it's quite important because whatever you build, whatever infrastructures you construct, uh, how, uh, they are uh, in this kind of region, they are very vulnerable to any act of terrorism and instability that it can cause. And you would really need to protect those infrastructures and make sure that people are safe. And in order to do that, you need an international mandate. Because you can't just protect without having a mandate and it being in such a versatile region. So probably these organizations, they are uh, capable of providing those mandates and providing uh, uh, resources necessary to do so. Again, for regional processes, I have already mentioned most of them just uh, to touch upon the migration, lots of people move here and there. I said some, some people work in Russia, some in South Korea, some go to China, some go to, some go from China, come from China, some go from, to Turkey. And this, part, this region constantly moves uh, and people move all around that. So I would probably be. Would probably be disappointed if I was from the business school and don't present SWOT analysis. <laughs> so we, we just decided to do it uh, to, to sum up uh, things that have already been said. 
So you see that in terms of, but, and this is made from the, the perspective of someone who is uh, a business implementing initiative, part of the initiative of the One Belt One Road. So in terms of uh, strengths, you see the nature of strategic location, nature of resources and human capital, in terms of weaknesses, again, it has already been addressed, infrastructure, bad bottlenecks, lack of institutions and issues with inclusivity. Uh, opportunities, uh, we believe that the major opportunity is uh, that is uh, connected with the uh, Eurasian integration platforms such as Eurasian Economy Union and the other initiative that ha has recently been uh, proposed by President Putin. It's a great comprehensive Eurasian partnership as well. But also uh, political transition within the countries that I mentioned as the shift of powers towards more the younger generation of leaders, more, more liberal, more um, modern thinking, and digitalization, which is, uh, I can't mention that, but uh, most of these countries are landlocked, so their economic potential can hardly be, you know, uh, mobilized to conventional uh, models, and uh, the digitalization provides huge opportunity for uh, them in, 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 in there, because, uh, again, if you connect human capital with landlocked economies, this probably makes it uh, quite obvious. And threats, with, uh, I have already mentioned that, uh, I have to wrap up quickly. So, uh, what are the success factors if someone is willing to work in this uh, region? And I, I, here is the quote from the yesterday's uh, presentation by Antonio Gutierrez uh, from the opening ceremony of One Road, One Road uh, Forum. And what he was saying is pretty much simple. You have to link this initiative, the Sustainable Development Goals. And Sustainable Development Goals can help to set up the policies and actions under Belt and Road. Why it is important? Because what we believe is that thinking of those uh, countries in, this, in Central Asia as to stress it, because what we hear, connection, China, one Belt, one road helps to connect China and Europe. But that sounds, first, it, it, it sounds like a huge opportunity for transit countries. But as long, on the way, we will see that the transit is not all that those countries aspire and not what they want. They want local legacy to be built they, uh, and they expect lots of uh, different um, like things uh, 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 that would help to raise human capital, uh, cap build local capacity, preserve their natural and cultural heritage. And this would definitely mean a lot for the strategists who are planning those those actions because you have to respect those expectations and those countries has, have huge potential to support but also to jeopardize the whole thing and we have to understand that the better we understand their expectations the better we can satisfy the needs of the people if they're the more successful the whole initiative will be and just to sum up albert has already mentioned that we believe that education uh, is a key because business schools and uh, universities can provide necessary infrastructures for scholars and businesses from the, uh, the countries in the region uh, along uh, the, the Belt and Road to learn more about each other, to uh, work, uh, learn how to work together and how to create value. Uh, you see that uh, Mr. Putin addressing yesterday's uh, forum in his opening speech specifically mentioned cooperation between business schools as a, as a crucial part of building the human uh, capital for the successful implementation of one by one world. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I realize that I'm you are ready for your dessert, so I don't know how much concentration you, you managed to keep after the two wonderful presentations. Um, so I'm going to try to brush it before you get to dessert, see if I can make it for you to listen. 
Um, I'm going to talk about actually hopefully something quite uh, related, but at least not uh, you know looking at the very same aspects we've discussed so far. I'm going to focus on the trade. I'm going to focus on financing, and probably much more. And you rightly pointed out that these are not transit economies; these are huge economies. Yeah. yeah. We have as many as 64 countries that should not be treated as transit economies. But I'm going to focus, because that's uh, my origin, about what Europe can do about this at the very end. Because we tend to forget that Europe is actually right there. Actually, Europeans tend to forget they're right there. And we had, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, the statements made yesterday during the, the plenary session, uh, especially Germany, uh, were very much in line with that idea that, okay, here we go, is this coming to us, are we ready, uh, do we like it, maybe not. So I'm, I'm going to try to change that a little bit and, and look at what actually Europe could benefit from, how much could Europe benefit from this um, strategy. And that is basically on many of trade, or at least that's what we've analyzed. Whether there's many more gains to be made, surely, but you know, the, our, our research has focused on trade and I want to share that with you. And you have a little bit of that in, in your folder uh, as a leadership, uh, thought leadership piece uh, published by, uh, by, the institute, by the Institute. So, trade. Um, why? are we arguing with an empirical study, a simple gravity model that trade, uh, that everybody actually will benefit from the Belt and Road, that is indeed, this is you know, literally statistical results, there is a win to win, at least for trade, for the Belt and Road. Well, it's, it's a very simple thing because we estimate in that a reduction in transportation costs, so you know, it's, it's very, very obvious. Now, because what we've seen so far, and my co-author Jiang Wei has actually gone all the way to Chongqing to look at the actual tariffs, you know, how much the cost of transportation, railway transportation, has been reduced so far, uh, country by country, we managed to introduce a reduction that went all the way to nearly 50%, depending on, on, on the different routes, of the current railway cost transportation for, for goods. And if you apply that very simply in, 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 in this um, model, you get to massive, uh, massive, I mean, you, you might not find it massive, but the 6%, which is what I'm going to show you in a minute, increase in global trade for Europe is actually quite massive. So the, this is what we find, that because, especially the railway uh, reduction in transportation costs is so massive, whether that is subsidized or not, you know, we can talk about it later. But, but if sustained, this should actually increase trade, especially in the countries, in the landlocked uh, countries of Europe, and the quote-unquote transit countries would of course benefit as much, if not more than Europe. And many people uh, in the business tell me, there was actually a very recent, a recent article by Tom Holland in the South China Man Post about oh, that's impossible because shipping is so much cheaper that there is no way that railway transportation can can actually substitute shipping. And I think reality today is starting to show that that might not be true, depending on which goods you're talking about. Of course, if these are bulk goods, maybe not, but there's many more things that China is exporting today that are not as bulky and that could well serve the purpose of reaching earlier uh, its destination at a slightly higher cost. So I do think that uh, railway transportation is an issue. And by the way, China is su such a special reality because if you look at this, uh, maritime uh, uh, transportation, uh, trade transportation is nearly 60% in China, and it's 70% rail transportation for Europe. Of course, Europe is smaller, but still, I mean, why is that such a huge difference? Because the roads were not there. The railway was not there. I just don't think that you can make that argument forever, that, that maritime transportation will always be the one and only cheap way to transport goods um, uh, across the globe from China as well, as well from, uh, to China. So this is the thing that we are, in our humble opinion, underestimating the role of railway transportation for trade. 
So these are the gains I just talked about. Uh, I, what will happen to trade, not for China. China is, the, of course, the, lar uh, the largest winner, but that's not the point. The point is, is, is it a win-win um, strategy? Or where it is, because everybody generally, generally, I can show you that the rest of the world, as you see there, is actually losing a little bit. That's mainly Japan and the U.S. That's the bulk of the loss. But if you look at the actual loss, it's very, very minimal. I mean, their trade falls very slightly, not even 1%. So that's all. The rest of the world actually has much higher gains in trade that can accommodate that minimal loss. Uh, so as you see, because of the, the reduction in trade, is, by the way, shipping, so maritime uh, route, the reductions that we've estimated look at, uh, looking at sample catalogs is no more than 10% because these ports were already so efficient. So it's not that you can become uh, much more efficient than you actually are, but that this was not the case for railway transportation. That's why the gains are so massively higher for Europe or non-European, not EU, but European or, or Central European countries. So that's basically the message behind um, then we go country by country, so we find that, you know, Belgium, Netherlands, Slovakia, Austria. So you can tell, yeah, the more you, you go east, and in a way the more landlocked you are, the more you benefit, the more you benefit from this strategy. Um, yeah, Japan is the top loser there, so, uh, but it's still, look at the scale, yeah, it's 0.14 reduction, but it's really nothing compared to the gains of nearly 9.4% for Belgium. So it's, it's very, uh, very different ballgame. Uh, now, so far so good, but we heard from Skolkovo and many others that so far we've only heard about infrastructure. Well, not really. Uh, at the summit yesterday we heard about many more things. Yeah, we heard about digital infrastructure. We heard about you know, all kinds of other things that are now in the ballgame. It's no longer, no longer about hard infrastructure only. And it shouldn't be. So if we were to move, and we can move in many directions, we have security, but we could argue that uh, in the light of uh, uh, vanishing, if I may say, TTP, no matter what Japan may do about it, there's kind of a gap, you know, and, and we could think of the Belt and Road as indeed a potential uh, area for a massive free trade agreement. Whether it starts from EU or elsewhere, it's, it's hard to tell. We also have, of course, recent in the ASEAN platform. Wherever it starts is actually a possibility. So what would happen if um, the Belt and Road countries were to engage in a massive free trade agreement? That would radically change uh, the gains for Europe. As I'm assuming that Europe would stay out of that block, which is very, very likely, as you can imagine, um, given you know the amount of trade uh, deals that we've signed lately, I would argue that that's very likely that Europe would stay uh, stay outside of that major trade block. If that were the case, Europe would no longer, notwithstanding the massive infrastructure being built, benefit as much because it would have, of course, an external tariff that would basically reduce those gains for Europe as opposed to the rest of the members of that free trade agreement. So that's the story. Europe should actually be quite happy about what we have now, and maybe less happy if this goes further into a real trade and investment integration zone. Okay, so now I move on because so far basically the message is as far as trade is concerned, and we could talk about many other aspects, this is a great round plan. Uh, it, it's great not only for China, it's probably also great for, me, for the recipient countries if you think about their infrastructure needs, but it's actually quite, quite good for Europe as well. Now, so if, if this is such a good idea, is there any bottleneck? Is, is there anything that could go wrong? And uh, let alone all of the issues we heard on, you know, diversity and, and a lot of security issues that, that I am going to absolutely talk about because that's not what I've analyzed so far. I'm going to focus on what I consider to be, as of today, still a major bottleneck, which is finance. And I was
was yesterday at the uh, at the group for uh, finance intercon and interconnectivity in the at the summit, and I felt quite relieved that this is becoming an issue. Uh, and I do think that much more would need to be done about the finance part of, of the story. Now, how much? First of all, how much needs to be spent? Because for us to assess whether there is any bottleneck, you know, we would have to have a figure in mind. And there's all kinds of figures there, you know, from that massive ADB uh, report, uh, figure coming from an ADB report on Asia's uh, investment needs. And this is, of course, beyond infrastructure. But, it, but they break down those needs, which uh, happen to have gone up from 8 trillion to 26 for, you know, Coincidentally, I don't know how much they managed to move that figure as high as that. We, we actually had a discussion at, at the Hong Kong Institute on this, but whatever, that 26 massive trillion US dollar out there, you can tell that power is uh, about 15, transport is 8. And this is really not all of the Belt and Road countries, as you can imagine, because this is Asia driven, so the, a few countries are not even included here. But you can tell that it's just massive numbers. It doesn't really matter how big, it's just massive. We heard, we've heard, we heard for a long time from Chinese officials, five trillion, that's what I'm going to work on, five trillion. But at the summit yesterday, we heard eight trillion. So, you know, it just basically, it's massive. It, I guess it, it's enough to say it's, it's very, very big. So, but now, how much has it been financed so far? Even this was hard to tell. Yesterday we heard some numbers from representatives of uh, China Development Bank, ICBC, Exim Bank, I mean chairman, not representative. And they, they dropped figures that to me were like astoundingly high, like, like ICBC in German uh, mentioned that they have already stock of loans of about 60 billion US dollars, 200 projects. It's like already quite massive. But again, the 5 trillion are like out there as, as, as impossibly impossible to achieve no matter how big the investment that the lending has already been. And most importantly, no matter how we read uh, all of this uh, news about AIB, and of course, uh, with all due respect to AIB, let alone uh, others trying to emulate AIB, World Bank, uh, President Kim was there yesterday, very, very active in this emulation of what the World Bank can do for the Belt and Road, ABB, their reality is that what they've invested so far is so tiny. 1.7 billion, this is AIB's own information from their web page, it's just nothing compared to the massive amount of investment needed. And it's not only what they invested, these boards, as you see in this graph, sorry, this is kind of hard to, if I can use the laser there. So this is what has been disbursed. Um, but there, so the multilateral banks, uh, Silver Fund, we don't have information, although they were, they've been recapitalized yesterday, we, we had this big announcement of the 100 billion revenue. Um, but the reality is that it's nothing. It, it, it's really nothing. It's, it's, it's 3 billion well, uh, compared to the 5 trillion. So I just think that we have to stop thinking that this project can be financed by multilaterals to start with. It just can't be. It's too large. It's uh, yesterday they said 12 times the Marshall Plan, whatever. We don't even know yet because we don't even know how much will be done. So, But it just sounds like astoundingly high. So multilaterals may have a role, of course, but they can't finance this project. Now, can Chinese banks finance this project? The, the wonderful 3 trillion reserves, the 50% savings, which of course are welcome. Uh, I think Chinese banks, frankly, will stretch their balance sheets in, in excess if they were to finance this uh, massive project. Again, we're talking about nearly twice the reserves if, if it were all financed in dollars, which of course can't be. Um, it's even for, a, for the size of Chinese banks, this is a massive project. And I just think that, that China has its own financing needs. I mean, it's just too large and probably not even if you think, as a macroeconomist, if I think of what would happen to my money supply if I were to do this in five years, because the five trillion, according to uh, Chinese uh, officials, was a five-year uh, plan, I 
just don't want to see the results of all of that. It's just massive uh, increase in my money supply that if I were to do it in Airbnb. If I were to do it in dollar, I may as well have to find quite a lot of offshore financing to do that. So I just think that this can't be handled by a single uh, country, even China, no matter their humongous financial resources. And I think that's where we're starting to get into. How can we finance beyond China's means? Uh, I think when this was announced, when the project was announced, China's uh, financial muscle was probably, uh, if I may say, maybe the project was smaller, China's financial muscle was larger. I mean, it was kind of a combination of something that could have been done that way. I, I think that today this is uh, much more complicated. Um, of course, the reserves are no longer the four trillion, they're three trillion, which is good, but you, know, you can tell that it's hard for China to just engage in this massive project and I'm sure those reserves come down. Um, so this is one important issue. So how to do it? One thing is, of course, Remimbi financing, Governor Joe mentioned uh, uh, local financing. He meant to say both Remimbi and local currency in the, in the host countries. And we can discuss about why that might be possible but might not be possible for trans uh, uh, country, tra trans border projects. So at the end of the day, B financing is of course a possibility, very much so when it's basically ch uh, Chinese infrastructure companies dealing with it. So it's like, like a barter, economy. but that is not something you can do for every infrastructure project. So I just think that this is not the only solution. Second one is uh, the fact that Chinese banks are worsening, uh, ha ha are experiencing a, a, much worse asset quality than in the past, which will affect their their eagerness to lend. Um, and then the possibility of offshore financing is, of course, to be considered. I think Hong Kong should be indeed a platform for Belt and Road uh, financing. Um, so you have in Hong Kong, only in Hong Kong, uh, 2.4, nearly 2.5 trillion US dollar in, in deposits, which could be well. Um, most of which increasingly in do dollar deposits, by the way. So, so as we move on, I think Hong Kong is a great platform for financing. Now, final word um, for Albert, you know, throws me out to my place. I wanted to say that we tend to forget that, and, and in fact, uh, Standard Charter Chairman Gulliver and, uh, sorry, uh, Jose Vignas and HSBC Chairman Gulliver were there yesterday, showing their interest in the project. I think we really can't forget that if there are large uh, players out there, these are global banks that have cross-border lending, that does look like you know the figures we're discussing. Yeah, it's a 15 trillion stock of cross-border lending in the world. By the way, more than half of which used to be now it's slightly less than half of which used to be European banks. So European banks have for for ages, including the Belt and Road countries, as you can tell here, it's like half of the Belt and Road cross-border lending is coming from European banks today. So I think the idea of in involving uh, banks, of course, they're on capital markets. So everybody will agree that infrastructure investment cannot only be financed by banks. But it will be very hard to move beyond banks to the rest of the financial sector, asset pension, you know, pension banks, etc., without getting global banks on board before that. So I'm just thinking that, that this is literally um, the, the way to go, to involve more global banks, to have more finance beyond what China can finance, which is of course a lot. So in a nutshell, more co-financing by, of course, host countries, but also by other beneficiaries. Europe is a major beneficiary, as I mentioned. And this is, I, I'm telling you, I'm not coming here with this message for Europe is the other way around. Europe is quite reluctant to hear this message. They feel that, why would I finance this? You know, why would I uh, engage in these high risky projects? It's, it's actually not getting that opportunity, which I think is massive. We do have our own plan. Nobody probably knows about this, but it's the Juncker plan, which is a massive investment plan in Europe, which now has projects that link with the Belt and Road. Those, uh, there's in fact, uh, at the European Commission, uh, a unit, uh, to look at the viability of transportation projects that that uh, engage in Europe or its surroundings and the Belt and Road. And I think that's the way to go, to find joint projects to be financed jointly, at least for those massive trans projects. Because otherwise I feel that it would be very hard in the long run
to find enough support for, for many of these better projects. So I leave it here. Thank you very much. So I want to thank all speakers. I think we've heard a very interesting set of views from the perspective of developing countries, from the perspective of Central Asia, from the perspective of Europe. Um, and it raises a lot of issues about what are the kind of constraints going to be to successful implementation of One Bell, One Road. So let me invite all of the three speakers to please uh, come to the stage and just sit and we'll uh, uh, discuss a few questions. Uh, we'll welcome questions. From, I think there's going to be a couple of microphones uh, that are ready. Uh, just raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Um, and uh, so, Justin. So, Alicia started kind of uh, discussing some of the bottlenecks and she focused on finance. But I wanted to maybe start the panel by asking uh, Justin and Alexia if they, what they see as some of the key challenges or barriers or difficulties to do this successfully, especially, I guess there's two concerns. One is that maybe some countries on the One Belt Road, one belt and road uh, will get left out because they're really not ready for the, and are there such countries and what kinds? And the other is some people are concerned that there's so much enthusiasm in China to spend big money on big projects. Is there any danger that these are going to be very low return or wasteful projects? So let me maybe ask Justin to reply first. I think a financial certainly is an obvious constraint. However, more important than that, I think it's ideal. Because for the infrastructure project to be sustainable, and to generate enough return for the investment, you need to have the selection of the project locations, and uh, also economic rationalities, and uh, because most country around this very road, uh, you know, low income country or low middle income country, and they are on the process of structural transformation from agrarian based, resources based country to industrialized country. But how to have a successful industrialization? We don't have too many experiences. Because certainly, many countries try to have industrialization in the past. But most of those kind of industrialization became quite relevant projects. And if they do not have industrialization, then a lot of investment in infrastructure may not be justifiable. Although certainly, you, know, you may be able to increase some of the trade and so on. But the actual water will not be large enough to justify you know, massive infrastructure investment. And, and, and so I think that that might be the main countries. We know that infrastructure project bottleneck has been there and obvious. The private sectors, their incentive to go to infrastructure is very low. And uh, I think the reason for that it's because judging on the experiences in those countries in the past, their economic performance were poor. And they cannot justify, justify the investment. So for me, you know, the idea to support or to initiate dynamic economic growth with the infrastructure as the leverage would be essential to make this Fair and Road Initiative at such a large scale to have a sustainable impact in the future. Yeah, I would say it's, uh, if you're talking about major constraints or challenges, uh, I should say it's probably about the governments and uh, institutions because um, when you when you do projects of that scale and that span, you will probably need uh, to engage with lots of stakeholders. And if it's done in, like, within the European Union, there are lots of institutions that support those, those projects, and you can, you can uh, there, are, there are practices, business practices, there are standards that you have to comply with, there are lots of uh, institutions that support 
Metro's uh, project implementation, and if something goes wrong, there is um, the, kind of the whole legal and court system that uh, helps to, you know, um, uh, ensure that it's done in a, in a proper way. In, in, uh, between China and Europe, there is nothing like that. The whole uh, wild area of different systems, different approaches to different uh, mindsets. And uh, so I think that the, the, the major risks uh, and the major challenge is how to build the system, uh, the uh, dialogue platform the, and the, the en enabling system that would help to uh, structure the projects in a way that they uh, take into account all the interests and balance them in a proper way that the governance in the project is uh, is uh, is set up in a proper way as well. And I would also mention that when we talk about from zero to one, I mean from 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 zero infrastructure projects to one infrastructure project, then it sounds like brilliant. Everybody's happy, but then there's when there's going to be hundreds of them. That's what will create the, the problem. And how you balance all that, what people gain, in fact, what people in the region will gain, that would probably be the major challenge. So uh, uh, that, that's what I think about it. So these comments remind me of a much older debate about foreign aid, that money doesn't solve all your problems, that you need the right governance and policies, and so maybe China needs to engage at the strategic, at the planning level as well as not just providing money for Maybe, yeah, sure. I'd like to try to put that into realities. If we have a historical perspective, if we see any country in the world to have transformation from agrarian basis to modern industrialized country, starting with good governance, good institutions, we did not see that at all. Are there any questions from the floor? Uh, yeah, okay, let me start here and then over here. Can you just say uh, uh, where you're from, your name and where you're from and then ask the question? Please try to keep the questions brief. to ask a question to the panel members, especially Professor Albert. And you are showing a framework to evaluate the risks investment in the Belt Road. And do you have any specific suggestions, measures for company is going to take on those kind of investment project they should uh, have before they invest a lot of money and uh, then suddenly find them to a very bad situation, uh, mingle together with the kind of political risk and also interdependence risk uh, between countries. I think that was for you. Yeah, I think that, uh, well, there are no very special tools for that. I think that the, the, the old tools are on the table. The problem is not the tools, but what to do with the what the, the instruments tell you, because if you, if you do all the risk analysis, you wouldn't probably go there. And uh, so probably it's not about analysis, it's about structuring your actions and engaging with the, the partners. My point here would be you can't, not, nobody can do anything on his or her own in, in this region. Okay, along the Belt and Road Initiative, it's not, it cannot be done in a, a single kind of um, model. Uh, it, it's hugely reliant, it has to be hugely reliant on stakeholder uh, engagement and importance. So all the projects, whatever size of the project is, small or huge, it has to be done in a, in a collaborative and partnership way with lots of uh, uh, institutions, companies involved. 
how whatever uh, kind of and that's probably the major risk uh, um, mitigation uh, uh, kind of response uh, I, I would probably suggest and so it's not probably about analysis it's probably more about how you structure your actions okay there was a question in here please excuse me both here first service all over the world when the number one in the world the biggest Swiss company and uh, no, well biggest in the world and we are Swiss company. When we look at the initiative when uh, we try to evaluate what's our opportunities and what the challenges we can solve and find there might be big problems in this all those projects. So let's talk about the infrastructure. Infrastructure the share of amount of money invested will catch the attention of everybody including corrupt officials, and in the world experience is sometimes even attract the attention of mafia to get the project. And then apparently, um, along the road, there were so many countries that had different quality requirements, safety issues, and the standards. That was the problem where uh, we are seeking that, whether we can help, and uh, how many research has done on that aspect, for example. I'd like to see that the, the, our Russian friends has mentioned our the President Putin has said this is a project integrating A, B, C, and lastly, technical and scientific basis. So that was mainly touched upon the standardization issue. And along those roads, given the standard. Can you please just get to the question if you have a question? Yeah, the know. question is that it seems that nobody has made research and that cover the risk that the technical and safety standards might become a geopolitical issue in the future because the Chinese side now announced that the mutual recognition of standards is the basic policy, but apparently that is not enough because if the project was purely financed by Chinese money, still there is a problem future if the rollout of the, those projects together with Chinese standards it is a problem for the future so my question is that for all those studies so we like to see that this part from our point of view is quite essential and it seems that the, neither Chinese side nor the other countries along the Belgian road has even considered about it so we were cautious about it and as company we learned about it we hope we can help but it sounds like nobody has mentioned it. Thank you. Okay, does anyone reply to that? I guess there would be an issue if you have, let's say, Russian standards and Chinese standards competing, you know, and it's tied to money and projects. But I don't know, does anyone want to comment on this? Maybe yeah, I can respond indirectly. <laughs> Certainly, as you mentioned, there's no study of that so far. But we know if there's a need, there's a way. If there's demand, there will be some time. And uh, I'm confident to say that it's because we observe the railway transportation from coastal city to Europe. And uh, in the past, we did not see that. In the past, we did not see that was not because there was no railways there. Because actually, without you know, build any new railroad, it's possible to connect the railroad transportation from coastal city all the way to Spain, to Germany, to Poland, to Russia. But in the past, nothing there was because, as you mentioned, the customs, the standards, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and so are so different. And uh, if you ask any trader to do that, they will not do that. But you know that under the leadership of the former mayor of Chongqing, he started to have that idea. 
and uh, try to turn Chongqing as an inner city, inland city in China, to be a port for Europe. So he started to call all the custom officials around the line to sit down together to discuss. We have the railways there. Yeah, why not we connect them together? But if we want to use the railway, we need have to high enough efficiency. And if we want to have high enough efficiency, we need to harmonize our policies. And then with this initiative, every country saw the opportunity and they come down, sit down. And now the transportation from Chongqing to Europe in the past, it may take two months as long as the seaport, the, the maritime transportation. Now it reduced down to only two weeks. So yes, you are right. But because in the past, there was no such a need for this kind of you know, evaluation assessment. But if you want to do the project, then we need to do the studies. I would just briefly add on that because maybe a year ago or so, uh, I've mentioned today this European uh, Eurasian Economic Union, Eurasian Economic Union. So the idea was to set up the the single set of standards and technical regulation uh, policies within the countries of Eurasian uh, Economic Union, and the idea was to make it as close to the European ones as possible. But two years ago, since uh, the so-called pivot to the east in Russian economy was uh, Kind of announced, uh, the ideas uh, uh, has changed, and uh, the people who are working on that they started to match and uh, see how it, it can be harmonized with Chinese set of standards, technical regulatory policies, and this sort of things. And I would say that it's not pretty much on the I don't know maybe there are some think tanks that do research on that, but uh, in fact, from what I see from my daily work, it's the routines of proper um, agencies in, in countries. Because what I see is that the Minister of Economic Development of Russia and the technical agency, technical regulator agency from Russia, they do it as a constant, on the constant basis, they work on harmonization of the standards and uh, uh, technical regulation since they've started. And it's, it's, it's a long way, absolutely, I fully agree with you. It's, but the, the, I wouldn't say that it's not in the agenda uh, so far. It is in the agenda, and people put a huge effort to harmonize the standards of technical regulatory policies. Uh, excuse me, sir. Okay. I think um, in, uh, multilaterals have a role to play. As I mentioned, they can't finance all of the projects, but they can be the, the, the initial, uh, um, the initial uh, financiers. So. I think they should be the ones trying to harmonize the standards or making sure that the quality standards are there. I think that's the role that AIB, uh, New Development Bank, World Bank, Asian Development should be playing in these projects by all means. Um, on that question very quickly, I think we can't forget the role of agencies in providing um, um, country risk uh, insurance. So, you know, the Japanese have been doing this for ages. I think China, of course, has its own sign of sure that's mainly trade. I think it, China should step up, and others, not only China, um, uh, country risk insurance agencies, uh, both public and private. We have COFAS, uh, which I think was acquired by, by Chinese. So, creating this uh, market insurance mechanism. Uh, is very, very important, and we're very far from having enough of that uh, for infrastructure investment. Okay, let's take one last question in the limits of time. I think Justin and some of our panelists have to run, so uh, can we have one last short question? Yeah. Yes, sir. My question is from Professor Justin. Uh, I'm Tim Kaman from Nanka University, and my question is about uh, the future of one belt and one road. It seems that it's just because of special interest, uh, Mr. Xi. Uh, he's focusing on w one belt and one road. He's making policies mm -hmm. and he's visiting many countries. He's arranging uh, some conferences, seminars, workshops like that. So uh, as a student, I just want to know about that. Uh, what will be the future of one belt and one road? 
Uh, would it be possible uh, that the next uh, leader of the China will take interest like this? Uh, 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 we, we are afraid and we think maybe that the next leader will not have special interest like Mr. Xi. He's the most strongest leader in the China, we think. He's, uh, he has special interest uh, on one belt and one road. So my question is about the uh, future of uh, one belt and one road. China seems to have a very good reputation about its international commitment. And uh, this is a commitment to the global community. So if we judge from the past, I think the future leaders will continue to implement that. That's one thing. And secondly, this is an initiative from President Xi. But such a big initiative, you always need to have someone to do it. And, uh, President Xi has this vision, and especially, uh, but as I mentioned in my talk, China currently is the second largest economy measured by the market exchange rate. China is already the largest economy measured by the purchasing popularity. And most likely, China will continue to maintain much higher growth rate than the US and other developed countries. So that means that China's economic size will you know, increase in the more bucky, more weighty in the global economy. And under the kind of situation, China certainly need to play a more important role in the global communities. And I think that one by one role is a way for China to you know, shoulder its responsibility and uh, to provide a vision for the coming world. And I don't think that there's any reason to reverse that. Because as long as China can continue to grow, the future leaders will also see the need for China to play a more important role in the world. So I think your question is good, but based on my understanding of Chinese history and my projection of China's future, I think the Chinese leader will continue to support this initiative. So on that optimistic note, I think uh, I'd like to close uh, today's event and thank uh, our panelists first for their excellent contributions. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming and uh, participating on our event today. And please stay in touch with uh, our institute and the other institutes we're working with. Uh, we'll hopefully be producing much more content on One Belt, One Road, one road in the years, uh, months and years uh, Forward, looking forward. Thank you very much.